Earlier this year, Cosmic Genome host Robin Ince took part in a study for the Neuroscience of Language Group at the University College London, run by Joseph Nikas, Amelia Mollenpakis and Dr Joseph Devlin. It's just so normal, average, everyday people yeah. who try this task can actually find it incredibly difficult, yeah, right? It I mean, it's super it's hard yeah. for them. I'm, I'm the study involved measuring changes in brain activity using functional MRI while participants performed a speech production task inspired by the BBC Radio 4 show Just a Minute. We can't actually interrupt you while you're doing it, so we won't buzz you. Okay. So I'll notice my own buzzes. I always that's one of my worst things about actually doing just a minute is I stop myself before even <laughs> Merton's noticed. It's infuriating. The aim was to determine whether there were differences in the levels or patterns of brain activity during the production of extemporaneous speech between the average person and those with above average ability in improvisation, such as radio DJs or stand-up comedians. Robin has been joined in the study by other Cosmic Genome contributors, including comedians Helen Keane and Richard Heron. One of the greatest strains of my current existence is veganism. For some ridiculous idea, perhaps because I have no religion, I have decided to punish myself instead by attempting to eat nothing containing dairy, egg or even things made by the wackle dance of a bee. After a few rounds of Just a Minute, or at least a slight variation of it, inside the MRI, Robin sat down to discuss the findings with Dr. Devlin. So what it's doing is it's taking a very quick picture of your brain every, uh, every one second, and it's taking a whole bunch of little slices sort of from the top all the way down to the bottom where, in fact, you can just about see your eyes. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit ghosty because these are happening in just one second through the yeah. whole brain. And then what we've done is we've taken like 500 of these over the 10 minutes that you were speaking. Yeah. And this is sensitive to um, oxygen levels in your blood, which vary depending on how much activity a particular brain area has. So as soon as an area becomes active, um, it, it increases its oxygen demand, and the blood flow there increases to compensate yeah. so that you don't sort of run out and have a stroke. Um, and the changes are actually incredibly small. If we flip through this, you wouldn't really see anything. <laughs> they right. all look the same. Um, so what we really do is we run it through some fairly serious number crunching, take about seven or eight hours, and that what leads to those sort of color pictures that we overlay on your brain and say, okay, well, when Robin was doing the, the just a minute task relative to counting, these are the brain areas that were preferentially engaged. Right. And the counting serves as a sort of control because when you're counting, you're still speaking, you're still hearing your voice. That's not the stuff we're really interested in. So we can kind of just subtract that out mm. and see, well, what was going on in the rest of your brain when you're thinking about actually producing the speech, you're controlling the way you're producing the speech, but you're not worried so much about the mechanics. Mm. And um, so that's what we'll do with these images, but that takes us, it'll be at least tomorrow at the very right. earliest before we have those numbers. And programs like House and ER have done us no favors because they have great shots of all these colors showing up on the screen while someone's in the scanner, which doesn't really reflect what really happens. Um, the last scan was just a nice picture of your brain. And this is always fun because I can sort of just show you your own brain, although you may have already had this at Imperial. Yeah, yeah but I like looking at it again. Cool. It's all right. Great. It's so fascinating. I just find the whole thing. The scanner does this weird thing where it does this reconstruction in 3D. So if you're ever curious what your head would look like carved out of wood, it can't see hair, by the way. Um, this is it, and you can see your brain. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, see, this I is haven't fun. seen one like that before. You can even see things like the lenses of your eyes there, by the way. So it's, it's great because you can see it all in situ. Are you able to, can I get hold of these? Yeah, I'm just, we're going to email this them to you. This would be fantastic because yeah. at the moment all I've got is I've got basically uh, in profile the journey through. Ah, oh, right. And, uh, but anything, even that as well, I just, you know, I, I like as much because I just, it's fascinating to me just to see the thing that, because I remember the first time that I, I saw my brain and I went, oh no, I'm not sure it's quite wrinkly enough. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'd yes. seen someone else's brain there and then someone said, oh, I wouldn't worry about that because actually some, too much of that and that leads to kind of conditions, Asperger's and autism. Right. That, that, right. So I was going, oh, that's great. So they said, that's about enough to at least, you know, comprehend enough of the yes. know, world, the world to you live continue in. to move through it. Absolutely. It's, I was um, told I had quite a big occipital lobe. Apparently, I've been looking at too many things. Is that right? That, that so was the one thing in Imperial that the... Uh, it's just, you see, that always fascinates me. I just find that such an incredible, beautiful piece of the... Uh, and then just to think about yeah. it, there's my kind of... You know, all, all, all that almost pseudoscience, but it, there's still an element, you know, the, the, there's the reptile. Right, that, there, exactly. There's me somewhere there, <laughs> you know. That's somewhere in here. That's the idea, right? So, in fact, yeah, exactly. So this is your spinal cord coming up into the brainstem, which, as you say, is the reptilian part of of your brain. It's the thing we share with uh, crocodiles and fish and birds and whatnot. 
Uh, so evolutionarily the oldest. Right behind that is your cerebellum, yeah. which is sometimes called the, the little brain. And the cerebellum has just about as many brain cells as the rest of the whole brain. It's, it's phenomenal, yeah. And it's incredibly oh, it's so fine grain. Delicate. That's the thing. Yeah. It's, it's the delicacy, the fear of, of when you see that and you think of the... I mean, what I find most intriguing is whenever you see, or not most intriguing, but whenever you see a brain and it's, you know, the start of the preservation has obviously begun and there's a solidity to it. And then when I'm told that it's just basically like kind of butter. It's, it is. It's, it's just like I would have said jello, that, but yeah. That's, that's really bizarre to think. Yeah, and that's why, you know, that's why we have this incredibly hard and thick skull around it. So the bone doesn't show up on the MR very well, but there's lots of soft tissue in here. So this is a, really a combination of scalp and what are called meninges, which are the protective material. And that stuff's incredibly robust. Like the dura, which is the, the lining inside the skull, you know, if you had to cut through it, like in an autopsy, it, it normally uses a saw, right? I mean, it's really well protected. On the other hand, if you slam your head hard enough, the stuff inside is like jello, right? I mean, it yeah. bounces off the front and the back. So if you're in a car accident where you hit the windshield, that's what happens. You get this trauma from just shaking the inside, not necessarily like a big hole or something that would, would happen during a stroke. Mm. Um, but it is incredibly soft. And it's, you know, I've done animal necropsies where you sort of go in and look, and it's just amazing how fragile it is once you're actually in there. When we normally do you know, post-mortem things, we, we put it in a solution that hardens it all up so that you can look at it without damaging it. So when you're doing a post-mortem, before you've actually got to the brain already, you have changed the structure of it in terms to give it a, a solid, you know, a, 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 are there some occasions where, I mean, in fact, well, at death, mm -hmm. how does the, uh, does the solidity change once the, yeah, it, is there a... It starts to liquefy. Oh, so it starts to liquefy. Yeah, it takes a little so that's while. Why, so you have to, what do you put in to make sure that when you do get to cutting in and you need right. to examine the brain, what kind of, what, what is uh, put into it to, to give it, maintain its solidity? So for animals, when we're doing it in terms of neuroscience, before we, we sacrifice the animal, you would infuse formaldehyde into their blood supply and that'll get into the brain and make it solid, but the, it'll also kill the animal. So yeah. you're, you're gonna sacrifice it before you cause it I'm the grief of that. I'm glad you still do it as sacrifice, so you are still offering it to some of the gods of, uh, of, of London University. That's good. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. So right. I know, you know these secular universities, a lot of them don't do as much sacrificing as they used to, so this is great. Not anymore, right? <laughs> um, but with humans, obviously, that's not, that's not an issue. Um, you can then, you can take the brain out if you're doing a postmortem and, and put it in a solution of formaldehyde. It's not as effective, um, but at least the human so died when first. So when it's being taken out, I mean, like, when you can feel that, Mm. What does it feel like? What is the, that? Blamange. It does feel like blamange. It yeah. feels. You have to be super careful that you don't damage it w in the process. And of course, it's very easy to do that. And uh, you know, neurosurgeons and, and uh, forensic people are actually quite good at, at, well, it's probably the forensic people who are the best at it. The neurosurgeons want to stay in. They want to cut it while you're alive and keep you alive in a perfect world. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of what you're finding out, I know this is quite an early stage of this particular piece of research. What are the expectations of the parts of the brain that become most active when, you know, artistically right. creating, whatever you might think, it, sure. improvised creativity? Well, some of what we would expect is Broca's area, which is a part of the brain that's involved in just simply speaking. Um, and then, you know, even in counting, you would normally see Broca's area relative to something that didn't involve speaking. But given that we're using that as a baseline, we're not sure whether we'll see Broca's area or not. It seems likely, given that the amount of effort that goes into constructing a, a really sequenced and controlled structure of speech is much more than it would take to just produce simple counting, right? Um, so that's one area that we would expect. We probably expect various areas that are involved in memory, as you draw on experiences to put there. But also, I would imagine for people like yourself who are very good at this, we should expect to see quite a lot of prefrontal cortex, sort of areas involved in control. So for normal speakers who haven't got a whole lot of experience and really can't improv, the idea of trying to control what they're saying is just so unusual that they actually fail at doing it for the most part. Right. They just put in all the ums and ahs and repeat and they, they mostly don't deviate from the topic, but they just can't help repeating themselves and hesitating to a fairly enormous extent. So when you're doing it and you're actually able to sort of keep to the structure of the task, you're doing two things. One, you're keeping track of all of that information and keeping those task constraints and delivering it. 
But in addition, you have a sense of uh, theory of mind. You're thinking about your audience. You're delivering it in a way that your audience finds appealing and entertaining, right? That's what being on the, the program is. If you could just do the task, but you were incredibly boring with it, they wouldn't invite you back, mm. right? There, so there are two different things that you're doing above and beyond some random college student who's come in and asked to do the task. And we expect to see different brain regions that are involved in that. Now, it could be that some of that is just, you're using the same regions that I would be doing if I was trying to do it, but you're using them in different ways. You're upregulating some areas, you're downregulating others. Um, and that would suggest, if that were the case, that maybe what you've got is some sort of intrinsic ability that you've probably built on, but you're using the same systems that anyone else would. Mm. But there also may be other areas that you're engaging that say I'm not or other you know, typical college students aren't that would suggest that maybe you're also bringing strategies into it. So in, independent of any sort of intrinsic innate abilities that you have that perhaps led you to this professional career that you're in, you probably have also developed all sorts of strategies for dealing with situations that I haven't, normal other people haven't, right? I mean, anytime you interact with your audience, you've got to be able to deal with the kind of nuts things that come out and do it in a way that's entertaining to your audience and acceptable within your show. Some of that's presumably strategic, right? I mean, you can tell me, but from my outside perspective, that seems the most likely scenario. Well, I find it, the, the change in the way that you structure something when you go on and you have a, a brand new load of ideas for a show. And then what I find most tedious is that when you first go on, you've just got a load of notes ideas are flying at incredible speed and you don't know really where they're coming you know when, when each one of those things that went up there uh i didn't try and start thinking as, as the five seconds i waited until when okay. it got zero just start talking and then just see what happens and then you're just doing lots of association and there's no kind of you know you're you're not you're conscious of, of talking but you're not conscious of where these things are coming from in the same right. way as most conversations that we're not but then once you've got ideas that work when you're doing shows it's much harder to rework that idea totally. So you okay. can keep adding bits to a routine, mm -hmm. but you go, fuck, I, I needed a joke on this particular idea, and I found it. And now finding a second, like once you've got the good, finding the, a new way of doing this right. routine becomes much harder. And you go, how was it that in the space of a week, you can have creativity, perhaps to create a 90 minute show. Right. Then that show stops being a creative, you, you keep changing, you improvise it, but it's still pretty solid. Yeah. And, and that's why I find that bit where as if the brain goes, it's fine, you've got some stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. the, and that, what else it, do you want? In improvised stuff where sometimes if I do shows and with a friend of mine we do shows and people sometimes shout out, we do a thing called pointless angle right to side, they have to say what they're angry about and then mm -hmm. we will start talking about whether that's pointless angle right to side. And the worst thing that anyone can shout is an idea that you've got a routine about. Because both ah. of us don't like the idea of going, brilliant, now we can do that five minutes. Yes. You have to find a new way of right. dealing with something that already you've come up with. And that I find interesting because it's much harder. Absolutely. That, because when you're coming up with ideas, you know, like in terms of actual writing, you always know the first idea is probably the idea the majority of people have had. So you have to work two further ideas along okay. to find the, yeah, if you're given a specific topic to, yeah. you know, topical comedy. That's why when people watch a show, sometimes they go, oh, I, I came up with that idea. They must have nicked it off me. You go, no, no, everyone came up with that <laughs> idea. That's the first idea when that happened. But yeah, I mean, I'm intrigued just by... Uh, um, Next issue will feature more of their conversation as well as some of the results that the study has found so far.